Uh, well, thank you so much indeed, uh, everybody, for inviting me here to, uh, to talk uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, just by way of background, I should explain that where I come from is that I've spent my whole career in uh, strategic management in the corporate sector. So most of my material, most of what I do is about helping businesses with their strategic plans and with solving uh, issues. Um, however, in, in recent years, uh, the work has been kind of transferred over into public sector and voluntary organizations as well. So this should be uh, useful for, uh, for, for most uh, cases. And uh, I should clarify, the, the word strategy dynamics, the, the only reason for that is that if you say the word system to anybody in management, they think you're talking about IT, right? Um, so uh, we're taking very well established strategy ideas, but we're actually imposing on them the really, really powerful things that system dynamics can do. So, as I say, I've been spending most of my time on, on general strategy issues, marketing issues, HR uh, challenges, those kinds of things. Um, but I thought I'd do something a bit different this morning, which is that I've recently had uh, reason to spend some time on doing models for early stage ventures. I'm going to take an example here of um, an early stage business and uh, it's a business which is, a, which is selling home control systems. Uh, and th this is a kind of business known as an internet of things business. The way it works is that you have uh, devices uh, attached to things in your home and uh, they respond to unexplained activity. So, you know, that window shouldn't be open. Uh, you know, we shouldn't, the power shouldn't be on here. Why is the heating gone on? Uh, why is there water flowing when there's nobody taking a bath? All those, those kinds of things. Uh, so the system tells the homeowner that something's happening. But the homeowner could be in the home or they could be uh, out of the home. And the homeowner can then respond and tell the system what to do about it. And key to this is that the system adapts to changing household behavior. So if people start changing their behavior, it learns what is normal activity. Uh, so it doesn't uh, alert you uh, just because you've changed your habits that something has gone wrong. Uh, a basic installation is possible for skilled uh, homeowners who can do, do basic do-it-yourself tasks at home. All systems can be set up by skilled installers. Uh, the initial unit cost, so this is the cost to us of making the system, you know, producing the devices and, and what they need to be connected. Uh, it starts at about $250, but as we produce more, we'll get experience curve and learning curve benefits from that, and that cost will fall. We then decide what price to charge to installers or to retailers who stock uh, the device. Um, consumers could buy it uh, off, our, off our website, but this is, what, this is the first of our decisions. The second thing we decide is we've got to get consumers to know about this, so we do web-based marketing. Uh, we also spend money on uh, magazine advertisements, you know, the Sunday uh, magazine supplements, those kinds of things. Uh, so our third decision is uh, how many salespeople we will have. Now, the reason we need salespeople is that these installers are relatively small local businesses all around the place. So, you know, a city of Sao Paulo, there could be five, seven, ten of these organizations. They're, they are installers who install... Um, uh, technology things in your home. So if you've got a, an electric garage door, that kind of thing. If you've got uh, remote control blinds on your windows. It, it's those kinds of companies. And there's quite a lot of them, so we need salespeople to persuade them to sell the product. Um, and when the product becomes popular, but only when it becomes popular, it is likely that retail store chains home improvement stores will start to stock the thing so the, the, the more skilled homeowners over here um, could actually buy it for themselves and install it at home. And not surprisingly, lower prices result in greater sales, both for installers and for, and for retailers. 
Um, so this is what the founder of this business hopes will happen over 36 months. So this is three years, 36 months. They hope that the unit sales will rise to something like, let's say, 8,000 units per month. And if that happens, they hope that we will move the business from losses. We're going to lose money. This, this is a really important uh, aspect and issue with early stage ventures. We know we're going to lose money from the start. And what we want to have happen is we want to get revenue and profit from these growing sales so that we gradually move to uh, break even and then we start to make profit. And this profit pays back all of the money we spent in those uh, early periods. So new venture challenges for founders and investors. Founders usually have not got the money themselves, so they're usually going and asking other people to invest. And we have this kind of generic pattern of um, early cash outflows that we hope to get back later. But if things don't go so well, we end up down here. Uh, we lose all the money. Investors uh, cry a lot. Uh, and then um, then uh, the business closes down. Um, and the, the track record for new venture uh, startups is very poor, um, depending on what you count and which economy you count it in. One in five being successful would be pretty good news. One in ten is more is more normal. Venture capital companies, uh, they're basically gambling. They're gambling that if they invest in in seven or eight uh, new ventures, one of them will work. Uh, and frankly, uh, from a kind of social uh, societal point of view and an economic point of view. That's unacceptable. Right? That, that should not be allowed to happen. So, here are some of the questions. Will it work at all? Right? Will anybody buy this thing? Will installers want to, want to stock it? Will retailers want to stock it? Can we make it for this price? Okay? Will it work at all? Um, and uh, One case I worked on uh, recently, the, the founder came and spent a morning uh, with me. We built the model for his business. And within two hours, we figured out it wouldn't work. It, there was just no plausible way you could put the numbers together and the business would work. It sounded okay on paper, but when you worked the numbers through and made the model work, the model said, uh-uh, it won't work. Uh, so we spent uh, the lunchtime figuring out how to change this business model and turn it into something that would work. How much funding would it need? That's all that money, that that triangular area there is a ton of money that you've got to put in before you get anything back. So how much do you need to put in? When will it pay off? Are you going to see break even here or here or here? Is this uh, two years or one year or three years or five years? When are you going to start getting some money back? And when you do, how much will you get back? Um, and then how are you going to manage this thing? You know, to, to get up here, you're now starting to talk about quite a large business, quite a lot of employees, quite a lot of marketing, quite a lot of customers, quite a lot of uh, distributors in this case. Uh, that's complicated. So how are you going to manage all of that? And there are, there are more questions as well. So I'm going to step back now and I'm going to ask a couple of questions. First of all, what help do we get from existing methods, the strategy tools that are taught in business school, the business model frameworks uh, that are quite popular as well. They're already out there being used. So what help are they in answering those questions? Then I'm going to ask the second question, which is, can a working quantified model improve and radically improve? I, I, I'm not interested in just making things a little bit better. We must be able to do very much better. A 1 in 10 failure rate is unacceptable. A 1 in 5 failure rate is unacceptable. We've got to do better than this. Can we help them with their planning, with their financing, and with their operations uh, challenges? So this is just a list. I, I'm not going to explain any of these, but if you pick up a strategy textbook and you go and look at the strategy curriculum in major business schools, uh, this is the kind of things that you will learn about this thing here, competitive forces, it's about how many other companies are trying to make profit out of the same thing. Will there be new competitors? Will companies leave the industry? Uh, this thing here, Blue Ocean, this is about, uh, well, if it's too competitive, 
in the in the business as you currently run it because there's lots of other companies is there a kind of nice clear blue ocean in which you can go and compete and there won't be any nasty competitors around uh, trying to spoil things for you uh, so these are the kinds of standard uh, strategy tools that are available they've been around for 30 40 50 years they're completely standard things uh, and they but what are the questions that they, that they answer they basically answer two fundamental questions. The first question is, where are we going to compete? In which part of the market with what products and services? And where are we going to be, uh, compete that could be profitable? The next question they help you with is how are you going to compete so you actually are profitable, right? So you've found an attractive market segment, now how am I actually going to make money out of this? Uh, and the, the, the fundamental uh, foundations from which this originates is from microeconomic uh, study and analysis of industry profitability and the distribution of profitability in an industry. So th this is the distribution of profitability being made by different companies in the same industry. So we've got a few down here making losses, we've got one up here making very high profits and most of them are kind of in the middle here somewhere making you know, quite good return on sales, return on capital. Right? We don't want to be in an industry like this, okay? according to these, these principles, where lots of companies are, are barely making profit at all, many more are making losses and not many are making much profit. So that's all about choosing where to compete. I need to find an industry or a part of an industry that looks like this and not like that. Right? The next part of the question is uh, how are we going to compete and that's about identifying resources and capabilities. Resources are things that we have. Do we have competitive uh, products? Do we have skilled staff? Do we have cost efficient uh, production facilities? Uh, do we have strong channels into, into the market? Capabilities are more about what is it that we need to be good at doing, right? Are we good at developing new products, uh, marketing those products out into the, into the marketplace? And if we are good at those things, and if we have those superior resources, then we can be this guy here, which is a big business and also making very high, well, quite high profitability, and not this guy down here, who is uh, somewhat smaller uh, and less profitable. So that's what standard strategy tools uh, help you think about. So think, about, think back to this home controls business. Who are we trying to serve? Well, we're trying to serve, we're trying to supply, we're trying to attract higher income homeowners. This is not a cheap product, so we, this won't be uh, attractive to, uh, to lower income homeowners. And we're trying to do it uh, through installers and retail stores. So th those are the people we're trying to, uh, to serve. Um, and there aren't really any significant alternatives. Uh, there will be competing solutions that look very like ours, but there isn't anything much else uh, already available. What resources do we need? Well, we need the product. And the product consists of the devices. They need to work. They need to do what they're supposed to do. We need the software and we need the, uh, the, the uh, server-based application that will tell the devices how to learn from the homeowner's behavior. We need staff, but they're, they're mostly not specialist staff. This is not a highly skilled uh, specialist sales force we need. Um, there's some support staff needed, but it's not particularly demanding. The other key resources, though, are the installers and the retail stores themselves. Uh, we don't need production facilities, we don't need distribution systems because we're going to outsource those. You can go to China and get these things made, right? That's uh, not a difficult thing to do. What do we need to be good at doing? Well, we certainly need to be good at web marketing and we need to be good at business-to-business -business, uh, sales uh, activity. We need to be good at doing those things. Is this a potentially attractive, profitable industry for us to be in? Well, it's a reasonable value proposition to all three of the, of the communities here. Um, 
if you are a homeowner, it could save you costs, it could save you damage to your home, um, and for, for that benefit, it's not uh, unreasonably expensive. There are somewhat limited barriers to entry, that most of the technology is basically available. The clever bit is in the software, right? The devices themselves, not especially uh, uh, unique, uh, but our, our um, unique advantage is the, the clever software that runs this thing. Having said that, new competitors are likely. In fact, I can tell you that uh, certainly in the UK, there are competitors already out there doing this. Um, it's just that this solution is rather more clever than, than what they're offering. So because there are new competitors, because other new competitors could start up, we've got to move pretty fast. You know, we can't hang about here. We've got to get this going so that we capture the, uh, the, the opportunity before other people come along and take it. So these strategy positioning methods that tell you where is a good place to compete, how we should compete, they are somewhat useful. Um, they've been used by consulting companies, uh, including me in, in, my, in my past life, uh, for a long time. They are useful. They do answer important questions. But they are limited. And the reason that they're limited is that when you ask those questions, the choice that you end up with very rarely changes. When you do that analysis, you don't get a different answer this year or next year or three years in the future or ten years in the future. And the simple fact is successful companies do not keep changing their mind about what they do. They do not. If you did a if you applied most of those strategy frameworks to, let's say, IKEA, right, you would get pretty much the same answer today that you would have got when IKEA opened its first store, is it 40 years ago? A long, long time ago. BMW's fundamental positioning in the car market hasn't changed for half a century. Southwest Airlines positioning in, in the airline industry hasn't fundamentally changed in 40 years. All right? there, are, there are adjustments. There might be extensions, but at, at its core, those answers don't change, which is kind of a bit limited when you're trying to figure out what to do each month that goes by. Right? You need answers. Uh, you need help uh, answering those questions. And the second thing is that many other companies choose the same position as you. In Europe today, there are approaching 50 low fare airlines. 50, that, not, not one five, five zero, 50. And their positioning is almost indistinguishable from each other. There are one or two exceptions. Um, EasyJet has got a somewhat different positioning than most of the other uh, low fare airlines, but fundamentally they're all offering the basic same value proposition and they all work basically the same way. So how do you explain that Ryanair's growth in cash flow is orders of magnitude greater than most of the other airlines in the, in the industry? You know, we're not talking about Ryanair making 10% profitability when everybody else is making 4, 5, 6. It's not that kind of difference. We're talking about Ryanair making billions in free cash flow when everybody else is making a few tens of millions, if they're lucky. Right? Orders of magnitude in performance differences. So there are some limitations. Uh, and fundamentally, the, these methods don't say anything at all about how to actually grow the business, how to make it work. The, uh, the second thing I'd just like to review is, th this really has been helpful. Okay, uh, the, the phrase business model has, has been pretty popular in recent years. It's a phrase of the moment, if you like. Uh, investors demand to be told, you know, tell us about your business model, please. Uh, consulting companies urge you to understand your business model. You've got to understand your business model. Consulting companies usually then follow up and say, well, whatever your business model is, it really ought to be changed, right? It can't possibly be any good. So uh, we're going to uh, advise you on how to change your business model. And uh, business schools offer courses on it, and there are literally hundreds of books and, uh, and articles about it. 
And there's no question, it, it is a, it's a uh, useful concept if you work it through properly. The uh, question is, is it always worked through properly? Does it provide anything useful? Well, what exactly is it? Well, you get as many different answers to that question as consultants who you ask. Uh, so here is what the Boston Consulting Group says a business model framework is. Uh, you describe the target segments you're, um, you're going for. You uh, describe the product or service you're offering uh, and the revenue model, how you're going to get money from, from people, from the target customers. That's your value proposition. Your operating mon uh, model, you describe the value chain and, the, and where the costs are going to come from and how you're going to organize it. You put those together and you get a business model. Uh, presumably, when Boston Consulting Group go and do this for their clients, uh, they say rather more about these things uh, than that simple diagram. But that's, that's a, a summary of it. And here's another one. This is... Uh, uh, PwC says that you really ought to get back to basics about what your business model is. And you've, th this is how you should go about doing it. You should describe how the company is structured, how it delivers its products and services. You should discuss the business model in the context of the overall strategy. And this is a quote from their, from their site. Uh, it actually says, uh, often using the terms interchangeably. So you use different words to, to mean the same things, and you use different words. You use different words to mean the same things, and you use the same words to mean different things. Right? I, think, I think that's what that means. Uh, you should explain how you make money. Uh, what is the model for making and selling products? You should explore value creation activities in freeform style, and you should look at your value chain, showing how the company operates to add value. But if you look at those words. Describe, discuss, explain, explore, look at. Right? It's all entirely qualitative. There is nothing here at all that tells you how to actually put any, any substance on these things. There's nothing at all. You know, we, we could be talking about a business employing five people or, or five million. Uh, we, we've no idea. Uh, now, this tool has been very much more uh, successful. It's known as the Business Model Canvas. And uh, it, it is probably the dominant tool now that people use for new venture, for specifying how new ventures should work. So let's actually go through and build up the business model canvas for the whole home control system business. Over on the right, you describe uh, and specify the customer segments that you're trying to serve. So in this case, initially tech savvy and higher income homeowners, later on, knowledgeable and lower income homeowners, but not the, not the very poorest homeowners. Customer relationships, where well, you have online relationships with consumers, when they've bought your devices, then they, then they register their system online. You have an online relationship with them. Um, you have a sales and supply and support relationship with installers, and you have a sales and supply relationship with, uh, with retailers. The channels, uh, you, you use indirect sales channels through installers and through retailers. We could add to that direct uh, sale to consumers off your website. The value proposition to the homeowner is that this is a low-cost uh, solution to avoiding expensive problems in your home. Uh, to installers, the value proposition is that this is an easy sell to existing and to potential new customers. So you're giving installers a way of winning new business, uh, which is going to make them, uh, make them money. So they, they should find that uh, attractive. To retailers, this is an incremental sales and cash flow opportunity. It's another thing on the, on the, on the shelves in the big do-it-yourself home improvement stores. Um, it's quite a high value item compared with others that they sell. So uh, retailers should be, should be interested in it. And of course, it makes them look as though they're at the kind of front edge of technology. They're, they're selling one of these kind of Internet of Things uh, products. Key resources you need here, the devices, the system and the software, the staff, and the installers and retailers themselves are, re are uh, resources here. Key activities, this gets a bit involved. You have to develop the device's software and system. That's basically done by this point. But we, we've got the thing basically working. 
Um, you've got to be able to do awareness marketing, you've got to recruit installers, you have to sell into store chains, you have to hire sales and support staff, you have to outsource and manage the production of uh, uh, product, you have to manage the supply chain to make sure that the product comes through and is available. Key partners are the installers, the retailers, the outsource manufacturer. Uh, and uh, how do we make money? The revenue comes from the wholesale price of units you sell. So you sell it at a price to the installers and the retailers. They then sell it at a higher price to the consumer. That's basically how it works. Uh, and the cost structure, well, there is a unit cost of making and supplying the thing. Um, and then you have costs of marketing, sales staff, and, uh, and overhead. So this is very useful, and uh, New Ventures spend a lot of time you know, debating, discussing, and evaluating whether this is right, you know, what kinds of numbers might be involved, uh, is it feasible, is this, is this value proposition going to work for this customer segment and for these channels? That, that's the, the kind of uses that, that this is put to. But questions remain. We need to go further than this. So the first thing is, we've got to start measuring some of these things. We've got to start putting some numbers on it. What quantities of resources are there? What, what do we mean by channels? What's, what, how many installers are there? How many retail stores? Um, how do we specify what customer relationships actually are? Then we've got to start putting scale on this. So are there 100 potential customers for this thing, or are there 100,000? Do we need to employ five staff for this thing, or do we need to employ 500? Um, is the price of it going to be $5 or $5,000? Right? We've, we've got to put scale on, on all of these things. Now, here's the key question. It's the one we started with way back at the beginning. Will this actually work? Right? We put all this together. Will it actually work? Will anybody buy it? Can we make it available? Will they pay us enough for it to make enough money to make it worthwhile to supply it? Will the installers want it? Will it work at all? Then we want to test it. We want to say, how sensitive is it to uncertainties? You know, if we've estimated this number of potential households, what if that number is only 20% of that? What if the number is five times larger? Uh, what if the, uh, the, the kind of threshold price for anyone to buy this thing is not $200, but $90? Right? We want to test sensitivities. We want to test our strategic choices. Um, and lastly, we want to fill in that chart we started with right at the beginning. What's going to happen to sales? And what's going to happen to cash flow? And how much financing does this need to get the thing going? Uh, so here are the generic important questions that strategy has to answer. For a continuing business, why have we got to here? History is important for two reasons. Firstly, it tells you how the system works. Secondly, historical things that have already happened are already determining what will happen in the future. If I did not launch the, um, a product 12 months ago, then I am not going to be currently experiencing the sales from that product. I won't be experiencing those sales from that product next year either. If I did not hire enough service people two years ago, they will not be there to provide the service capacity to serve my customers uh, in the future. Okay? So things that happen in the past already determine what's going to happen in the future. Then we want to know what's going to happen if we just carry on as, as we are. It might be okay. Right? The business as usual might be absolutely fine, but it might not. And if it's not, we want to answer the third question, which is, how to make performance improve. Now, what do we mean by performance? Now, you remember when I was talking about the strategy tools, performance was profitability, return on sales, return on capital. All right? But that's not what investors invest their money in, in, in your business for. You have got to stop the competitor taking your sales away. And look, this, this is, you know, we've, we've got about five weeks to, to figure out what to do, and we've got about 10 weeks to either succeed or fail. Right? This, this is not a five-year business plan. This is 15 weeks. 
right? We've got to crack this and we've got to crack it fast. Is it strategic? Absolutely. This business accounts for 30% of this division's profits. If this business goes down here, its CEO is out of a job and this business could well fail, right? So it may be only 15 weeks, but it is certainly strategically important. Here's an aerospace company suffering key uh, turnover of uh, key staff. They train up these bright young things from technical universities. They stay there for two or three years, and then they go off and they get a job in the finance industry, right? Uh, because the finance industry can pay them twice the salaries. Uh, so um, that's what they fear will happen. You know, uh, uh, turnover has been rising over the last year. Uh, we fear it's going to get worse and worse. How do we get that uh, uh, turnover down? Here's a, a, a large telecoms company trying to roll out a new service uh, offering to, uh, to telecoms customers. And it, they haven't been doing very well. You know, they've, look at this. It's absolutely feeble. Um, and uh, if they're not careful, it will go on like this. And it really should be up here. Right. So we want to help them do that. Uh, here's an investment company. This is uh, a pension fund company looking after our money uh, in the, uh, by investing in, uh, in, in funds. And uh, they've had a really, really bad time. And if they're not careful, it's going to get worse. They're probably going to get, uh, go out of business. Uh, but can we fix this and, and bring things back up again uh, before they, uh, they get too bad? So what do we really need from business models? We need quantified working models that replicate how the real world works. Right? That's the business we're in. That's what system dynamics do, does. Right? We aim to replicate what's happening in the real world. Why do we want to do that? So we can explore the future, both our own strategies and our sensitivities to external events. Now, those questions arise at two different levels. Okay, two different levels for this question and two different kinds of purpose. Uh, the first purpose is for an overall plan, the strategic plan for a whole company or the strategy for a new enterprise. And this is for the whole organization. But organizations also have to tackle uh, the second kind of purpose, which is uh, um, dealing with specific issues that come up from time to time. So defeating that competitor, drugs company, this was an issue, it was a challenge, it was an event. They had to handle that event. It's not part of a continuing plan. It is a, a thing on its own that we've got to fix. When we take over another company, that's an event. It's an, a challenge. We've got to figure out how we're going to do that. Or like the investment company responding to a recession. But those two purposes also apply at the functional level to, to a piece of the business. So we need a marketing plan or a human resources strategy or we need an IT strategy that runs on from year to year to year to year. But functions too have issues that they need to, to deal with. Fixing poor service quality, changing the uh, skill mix of, of a team, cutting new product uh, lead time, so all of those kinds of things. What this means then is that strategy, you know, I've, for as long as I've been talking about strategy and working in the field, people seem to think it's just a little special thing that, that the, only the top management team do, and they do it once a year. They go away and have away days, and they come back with tablets of stone on which are written the strategy, right? That's not what strategy is. Strategy is every manager's job. Every manager with a significant degree of, of responsibility for anything more than just day-to-day -day adequate operations. If you've got responsibility for anything more than that, then strategy is your job too. It's not just the CEO and it's not just the board. Uh, and what that means is that we have uh, non-financial challenges that have got exactly the same character. They too have got a history. They too have got a future which might get worse and we want to improve it. But now, we're looking at staff turnover or service quality or market reputation or new product lead time or whatever it may be 
on this performance axis, but it's the same form of chart. Now, th this, is, this is meat and drink to system dynamics people. This is our reference mode, right? Th this is the, the chart we start from. This is how things are changing uh, and could change. And this is what we're trying to get our models to explain and to help with. Um, so what we need then, and what we've not been able to do until quite recently, is we've got to get from the strategy to a time phase action plan. We've got to figure out who's going to do what, when, how much, with what likely impact on, on performance. Only then can you get to the financial and other results the business is going to produce. You can't jump from here to here. But that's what we've been trying to do for the last half century. Write down the strategy and then go and uh, you know, project the financial results that will come out of it. And it, uh, frankly, it's not good enough. It's not good enough for investors. It's not good enough for employees. It's not good enough for customers. And it's not good enough for, for our economists. We must do better. And this is what we've not been able to do. Figure out what to do. Uh, when we've got some financial results, then we start getting some uh, information out of that. We get some key performance indicators, if you like, or some balanced scorecard results, which we then use to go back in and uh, fix the time-phased action plan. So how should our home controls uh, business system work? Well, we've got, uh, we want to grow the sales to uh, homeowners and our marketing will we'll make that happen. We're, well, it'll get them interested. It'll get people interested. It won't actually sell very much to them. Right. To sell it to them, uh, certainly in the early days, we need the installers. The installers sell to early adopters uh, among the homeowners. So we need the salespeople to promote the product to the installers. You've been able to see some of the items that we had on the, on the uh, business model canvas. You see them beginning to get kind of connected up and linked together here. If we lower the price, then we expect that more of those potentially interested homeowners would buy the product. And if all that starts happening, then retailers will start stocking the product. And out of all that, we get essentially the financials, the income statement. Revenue comes from sales multiplied by price minus the cost of the product. That leaves uh, gross profit. Uh, and you take off that the cost of sales and marketing costs and overhead, and that leaves you with uh, an operating profit, we hope. So will it, is the question. So if you go to that link, sdl.re, home controls one, this is what you will see. This is a control panel for the system dynamics model that actually is this business. Right. And... Uh, the first column here is just keeping a track of your, your decisions. This is the sales performance. This is your income statement. And this tells you what's happening to your cash. Um, you're raising cash. So this is all the cash you've raised. And this is what happens as you use up that cash uh, growing the business. Uh, this is how you use it. You click on that little button down there at the bottom of the screen. And that will give you some play controls. And when you get the play controls, you uh, click on the green button to start a comparison. This allows you to compare your decisions with what the model's uh, base decisions are. Uh, when you do that, you get this little panel at the bottom. We've given you control over three items here. The price that installers will, uh, you will charge installers and retailers. How much marketing you will spend in thousands of dollars to, to get consumers interested and how many sales staff you will employ to go to installers. So you enter the decision values. You, it's very simple. You just click play, change the decisions as you go, um, repeat all the way through to the end over 36 months, and uh, see if you can do better. Um, you can try it as many times as you like. Just click reset to start again. And what's on these charts? If you look at all of these charts, some of them have got dotted lines. Now, you remember right at the beginning, I showed you those charts of, of sales growth? That's that dotted line. I showed you a chart of operating profit growth. Well, that's that dotted line there. 
and the thin lines are the base case. If I just put in some numbers and run it, this is what I get. Uh, so how is a system view going to solve this challenge? Well, you have to stand back and say, well, what is a business? What is an organization? What is an enterprise? Any enterprise is a designed system, whether intentionally or not. People have made it the way it is. They have created it to work in a certain way. So they've uh, got two responsibilities. Firstly, they've got to design the system so that it could perform well. Then they've got to manage the system so that it actually does perform well. 